But this panel this afternoon will focus on women's thought, looking at the possibilities, if you will, for church, society, and for our own everyday lives. And in this conversation for this afternoon, we have three presenters who are before you, Dr. Judy Ventress Williams, Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas, and Reverend Dr. Melanie Jones. So I'm going to introduce them to you. You have the uh, their bios in the program, but just for purposes of saying their names and letting you know who they are. Dr. Judy Ventress Williams is professor of Old Testament at Virginia Theological Seminary, and she's also an ordained Baptist minister and serves as director of Christian education at Alfred Street Baptist Church. She recently published a commentary on the Book of Ruth, and she has been very active in this local area in ministry and in the academy. Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas is Associate Professor of Ethics and Society at the Vanderbilt University School of Divinity. She is Executive Director of both the Society of Christian Ethics and the nationally acclaimed Black Religious Scholars Group. And she also serves as co-founder of the Society for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Religion. It's not mentioned in her bio, but of course she's published several um, books and essays. But for our purposes tonight, I do want to lift up uh, her book, Deeper, or this afternoon, her book, Deeper Shades of Purple. Womanism in Religion and Society. She's the editor of that volume. And we also have Reverend Melanie C. Jones. And Reverend Jones is visiting professor and black religious scholar in residence at the Seminary of the Southwest. She is co-founder of the Millennial Womanism Project an enterprise committed to enhancing the well-being of black millennial women of faith and justice and fostering transgenerational womanist dialogue. I asked uh, Reverend Jones and soon to be Dr. Jones to give me the title of her dissertation because we are speaking it into completion here. And she's working on a dissertation up against a crooked gospel. Ah. Black women's bodies and politics of character in religion and society. So nice. these are our speakers for this afternoon. Each one will take 10 to 15 minutes to address one or more of the following questions. I just want you to know what they've been asked to do. First question, what key themes are being addressed today by womanist scholars in your field of study? Are you engaged in any collaborative work with womanist scholars? And how is womanist scholarship regarded in your churches? And finally, what is your greatest hope for the future impact of womanist scholarship? So this, my friends, is what you would consider the second generation or the, the, the byproduct if you will, of what we received earlier this morning and in the second generation and beyond. And that's what we hope we'll have a conversation this afternoon that will take us into our next season of scholarship and ministry and advocacy. So I invite Dr. Pinterest Williams to get us started this afternoon. And then we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I begin this time with a profound sense of gratitude. I look at the picture on that program and can honestly say, because of that we are. I want to say a few words about biblical studies because biblical studies is a particularly pernicious field in religion. Um, there are many black ethicists and theologians who wanted to be Bible scholars. But there's there's a lot of insider information. There was a lot of insider information. And you had to know what to do early on. 
You couldn't decide in the middle of your seminary career that you wanted to do biblical studies because you would have already been behind. And this information is not forthcoming because people who get to talk about interpreting texts um, can be in power. And so I am grateful um, that there were people who were there for me at the beginning to say, yes, take three years of biblical Hebrew. Yes, take at least two years of Hebrew. Yes, take the summer courses. Yes, do your modern languages early. Um, who helped me in knowing what to do and encouraged me. Um, there's something um, there's something very vulnerable about being the only person of color in your program or in your department. And if you're not careful, you can tell yourself that you can't make mistakes. And that is crazy making. And so I'm grateful that even though there were not people there who looked like me, I knew there was a renewal means. And I knew there was a Clarice Martin. And I knew that there was an Emily Towns and a Cheryl Sanders and a Cheryl Thompson Gilks. And I got to see them through FTE and all of these other opportunities. Um, through FTE, I was able to journey along with Valerie Benjamin and Cheryl Anderson and Gay Byron and know that I was not alone. And so I'm grateful for all of the people who decoded and opened doors and helped us to make this journey. Biblical studies is not just hard to get into, it's hard to survive. Um, historical critical analysis is the standard. It is a European, primarily male perspective that claims to be detached and objective when in fact it is not. And the reason that matters is because if you're being told that this is objective, then what you are doing is subjective. What you are doing is rooted in your experience and it's emotional, and it's not scientific, and therefore secondary problematic, and you need to get fixed. Mm. I say that, and that's important because what that means is that when I was going through graduate school, and I was able to draw on the work of a Renita Weems or a Clarice Martin and a Randy Bickett and a Vincent Wimbush. It means that they had exposed themselves to that criticism in order to produce the work that I needed to do whatever it was that I was going to do. And so when we recognize not only the ancestors, it's really important for me that we name that they were making it as they did it. They were building the plane as they did. And that some of them were then generous enough in the midst of all that to spend time mentoring. Yeah. We are here because they are. The work of women scholars in Bible, in my mind, is important because of what happens in the way of language. That the language and vocabulary of women scholarship helped to create a new way of seeing and being and doing. When we name the work of intersectionality that black women do, uh, we allow people to get their hands and their heads around it, and begin to analyze it and find themselves in it. And the beauty of intersectionality and the work that womanist biblical scholarship lifts up is that it is open, it is inviting, there is room for people to come in and find themselves, which works against the model in which we were trained. So we're trained in a model that is exclusive and narrow, and you're either in or you're out, and here comes this language that opens this up. And by virtue of opening it up for women of color, it opens up the playing field for everyone. Once again, black women are saving the world. Um, this language and these words matter. The vocabulary helps us to see a new way of defining and clarifying who we are and what we do. In addition to the, the foundational work that was mentioned in the first hour, I wanted to lift up a couple of things. I wanted to lift up my National Junior's book that defines and kind of helps to organize thoughts around womanist work in Bible. I am tickled pink by Will Gaffney's book on womanist midrash, and she's been currently working on the next book. And I want to come back to that in a moment. But I also want to lift up the volume edited by my colleague and friend Dave Byron and Vanessa Lovelace, particularly because the second part of the title is 
expanding the discourse. This to me is the language we want to use to think about what womanist scholarship actually does. Expand the discourse, open up things so that we can begin to think about our work as full human beings. <coughs> Intersectionality and womanist scholarship was born out of the black women's refusal to be disintegrated or to be dismembered or dismantled. The fact that they, and, and, and this, is, this matters because I think what we want to recognize is that um, prior to this time, anyone who was doing this work, whether they knew it or not, were kind of cutting themselves off. You had to cut yourself off emotionally to do work in a certain way. So when the woman is interpreters of Bible came in and said, no, we're bringing our own selves, they change the playing field of what we do forever. And it opened up for people from other groups to come in and do this kind of work. Woman in Scholarship shows us that language and words matter. But expanding the discourse in my mind that not only helps us in the academy, but because it is intersectional work and because it is integrated work, is adept, if we use it correctly, at bringing this kind of thinking into our churches and our congregations. So I want to say a little bit about women's scholarship in the churches. Um, I served at a, a, a thriving African-American Baptist church that I would describe as progressive. Um, having said that, there are people who um, are not progressive in their thinking. And I want to describe how we have encountered and worked with a womanist perspective. So one way to work in a church, and I was so thankful for Dr. Um, Jones' comments on how we interact with churches, it is not helpful when scholars come in and are looking down their noses. It is not helpful when scholars come in and use all the new vocabulary they just learned last week. Right? It's not like you've never heard regular words. Um, it's not helpful. So um, this work that we do in churches comes out of relationships. You have a relationship with your congregation and know what they can hear what they can't hear. And how to package things that they cannot hear in ways that they can hear it. Um, there's more than one way to speak it. If anyone is good at code switching, it should be people of color. How do we do that to facilitate learning in our churches? So that in our Bible studies at Alfred Street, we were doing liberation and womanist work, but we never called it that. We just did it. And then when we bring in a woman as a scholar, such as Dr. Dave Iron, people say, oh, oh yeah, I recognize that. I see myself in that. And so we invited um, Valerie Richmond to come for the January Bible study, which is when we bring in scholars. Um, and we say, we're going to raise the bar. We're going to engage you differently. We give people permission to disagree and not see everything the same way. You don't have to agree, but you must think. Um, so we've had uh, women scholars come for two consecutive years, and now I'm delighted to say I have a group of women who are pounding down my door because they want to have their own womanist group, and they want to bring in their own speakers, and they've taken ownership. And so I think the trick is, if we think about expanding the discourse to acknowledge where people are, and to engage them in conversations, and show them ways in which the text itself is inviting us into a broader way of seeing and being and doing. Churches are complicated because they tend to be hierarchical and sexist, um, and we need to continue to do the work around the language, the language we use to refer to God, the language we use to refer to the Holy Spirit, the hymns that we sing, and inviting people to be flexible in how they understand God. Intersectionality reminds us, particularly in the black church, this is not just about race and gender. It is about orientation. And we have a lot of work to do in understanding what it means to be fully human. So if I were to answer the following, the last question, which is what is your best hope for the future impact of women's scholarship? 
I would love for us to follow Mother's scholarship and thought in the work of embodiment. We are a people who have been damaged because of our embodiment. And we have trauma around our embodiment. And it manifests itself in the way we deal with our sexuality, the way we deal with our bodies. It is a personal pet peeve of mine as a uh, woman whose mother died of breast cancer, that black women have breast cancer at a lower rate, but we die more because we're afraid of touching our breasts. Yeah. Mm. This is fundamentally problematic. Yeah. And so the work around human sexuality, in my mind, is an outgrowth of the fact that we need to figure out how to feel good yeah. in the bodies that God blessed us with. Mm. And so my point for this fellowship is that this is the place from which that expansive conversation takes place so that we can be fully human, fully authentic, spirit embodied, yeah. beautiful people in the church. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is a particular um, honor to be here today. Um, just to be in a space that is literally a woman's space, because it's a woman's house. So I, it is incredible that something that was just a word, that was assumed to be scandalous, that works at a bad at best, now has a house. So, uh, in honor and celebration of my sister of love, who was first a virtual sister of love, uh, Dean Pierce. Thank you so much to be here. <laughs> it's also wonderful to be at a place that is a say, a moment because when we talk about the birthplace of womanism, when we talk about what it means to create institutions. We know that as black people, we are a hush our invisible institution people made in faith. And unfortunately, when we do the genealogy, oftentimes uh, it gets attributed to the biggest house at the time or what, where people want to hang their coats. So the same way that many of us who grew up on Nana's Biscuits, we go and look at Martha Stewart's living to find a cheaper version uh, that was wrong or appropriated without reciprocity. So it's important that we're here. It's important that we're in power. And while there have been many PWI institutions where womanists have done their work, the fact that the first and the birthplace of the gathering in the hush mark happened here. Um, so I thank God for the, the facilitator, the grandchild, and the spirit and the hostess of this event, who's always been, as we say, other mother and other mentor to be Dr. Cheryl Sanders. <laughs> and so um, I'm Baptist, so I can be long-winded, and I know that here we serve a all time time. Yes, she is. <laughs> I'm going to try to attend quickly, first with a few printed words to keep my time, and then uh, to try to respond to some of the questions in tow. What we have done over these 30 years of womanism has been um, a pageant, a protest, and a parade that has been done this far, not only by faith, but also by force. Womanism has been a journey uh, led by faith and force, and if I could borrow uh, uh, the motto from Dr. Weems and I's cook group that we're both a part of, uh, this woman's work is one of piecing together our past while keeping each other in stitches. Piecing together our past while keeping each other in stitches. I'm a womanist ethicist, and that a womanist social Christian ethicist, and that is both a confession and a profession. 
Now, at an early age, I developed an interest in the complex relationship between norms and actions, which fixates ethicists most of the time. But although I neither had the scholarly language of ethics, nor the axiological framework of my favorite methodology, sociology and religion, necessary to gauge my observation at that time, I have always been intrigued to find that the relationship between the theological, quasi-spiritual preaching of many black ministers and church leaders, those who have arguably been called by God, and the actual practices of these self-same purveyors of the word of God, were never in perfect accord. There, the moral fallacy of my young reasoning line, but I thought that faith, teachings, and preachings would dictate action. So even though I grew up in a black missionary Baptist church in a place called the City of Christ, Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas, I realized that even within those black spaces where racial justice was heralded, that there was still a lot of oppression among the oppressed. Uh, when who was profiled as a fool or the sinner based on how they dressed or what they said, uh, showed whether or not they were children of God. And as an early child, my best friend, who was six at the time, realized that God was dog spelled backwards because he was learning how to spell, got thrown out of church and never came back and gang bang and ended up dumping mm. because of the anti-intellectualism mm. yeah. of a church that didn't know how to meet people where they are and encourage children. Found myself then later going to Vassar College where I realized that as a thinking woman, I assumed that to be a feminist meant that you definitely practice what you taught. And I realized that although appropriation when my force was appreciated, either my faith was problematized, or my realities were not taken in turn. So as an African-American woman who's a follower of the Luke 418 version of Jesus Christ, there is an ever-speaking mind in the eye body as one whose very being is this. Daisy is an amalgamation of having African blood and looking like it being a descendant of American enslavement and a water and fire baptized Christian was a black woman is Irish scorned, shunned, set aside, sentenced, or silenced by any normative reflection of myself among my brothers or white sisters within society and in many of the preachings and teachings about scripture. In a novel, The Color of Purple, Alice Walker offers a salient example of this irony. And I just want to quote it. Many of you might remember, but I want to quote it so I want to appropriate Walker's or Seeley's words um, in, 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 in my contextualization. So, in a letter to her sister, you might recall, Betty writes, I don't write to God no more, I write you. What happened to God, Ashley? Who that I say? She looked at me serious. Big and devil as you is, I say, you ain't worried about no God, surely. She said, wait a minute, hold on just a minute. Just because us don't harass it like some of us don't, don't mean I don't got no religion. Mm -hmm. What God did for me, I asked. She said, seemingly like she's shocked. He gave you good life, good health, and a woman who loves you to death. Yeah, I say. And he gave me a lynch dad, mm -hmm. a crazy mom. Well, no, not a daughter of a stepmom, a sister I probably won't ever see again. Anyhow, I say, the guy I've been writing to and writing to is a man that act like all the other princes I know. Trifle, mm -hmm. forgetful, and low down. She said, Miss Celia, you better hush. God might give you let him hear me ask him. If you ever listen to poor colored women, the world would be a different place. <laughs> Stevie reminds us that in the words of womanist writer Pearl Clay, that while only certain people get to talk to God, everybody gets to talk to the devil. Mm. And sometimes with the voice of God. Mm. And if the deal goes down like it's supposed to, some of us not only talk, 
but become that. The world of difference that exists between Celia and her perception of a Eurocentric, anthropomorphic, and sexist image of God is made all the more dangerous because he is found not only to be alien in nature, but more importantly, alienated by disposition. And we all know too well where this came from. Probably from the theology and teachings of racist, Eurocentric doctrine or the patriarchal, toxic, masculine renderings of preaching a God Or by the empathy that turns into sympathy that lacks solidarity among white feminism. Within Seeley's point of depiction of material suffering and soul murder, dealt at the hands of colonizing religion and being in solidarity with people who might share their body parts but don't share their state of mind. She's able to articulate her cognitive dissonance regarding her lifelong relationship with God and men and others. During the course of this intimate disclosure to her sister, Celie professes the abundant faith she's always demonstrated, the miserable return which has met her investment, and her realization that the world would be a better place if God could see it through her eyes. My good friend, book club co-member, and now some adaptable woman as a literary theorist, Hortense Spiller says, let's face it, I'm a marked woman, but not everybody knows my name. Peaches and brown sugar, satellite, earth mother, auntie, granny, gods, holy fool, a Miss Ebony first or the black woman at the podium, I describe a locus of confounded identities, a meeting ground of investments and privations in the national treasury of rhetorical wealth. My country needs me, and if I were not here, I would have been invented. Mm -hmm. 1993 in Atlanta, Georgia, in the stacks at Pitt's Theological Library. I find myself having to write a position paper on a question that should be based on something that we thought would inform our profession, but we might wrestle with that person. At the time, I thought it was going to be a lawyer. And my question was, could one actually be a lawyer in the United States where you manage your office and actually profess to be a Christian at the same time. Mm -hmm. It led me to the stats where I came upon a book called Black Women's Ethics. I had neither heard the name Katie Hinton or the word honest. But that Tuesday evening, I literally stood in the stacks and read every page of that text. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning for me was the word and the word was womanism. And womanism spoke to me and took my mind to a place where my soul had always been, black city. And as I understood that text in light of this urgency and how we understand the real lived situations of siblings, I still wanted to find a way of bringing that to the same missionary, the same Baptist missionary Baptist churches, or the Providence Baptist churches, or the Mount Zion Baptist churches, all the Baptist churches that have marked my life through predominantly white institutions. And then there was a conference at Vanderbilt Divinity School in 1993, no, 1992, where I engaged uh, Rene Williams. And there, I realized that not only can I talk back, but clap back, but in the way I got the body with pushing back, I was actually seeing that when we can come to know who Jesus really was, how faith really worked, it was always a woman who was activating Jesus before Jesus was ready to work on the back. And if you really think about that, that is, and so from that word came then the word. The work and witness of womanness. Now, I have always been an ethicist, unlike my mentor, Katie Cannon, who was a, a 
aspiring Hebrew biblical scholar who was told, no, your father can't even read. So you, you don't only not need to read the word, preach the word, you're definitely not going to be able to teach the word. Uh, I, I, I found the multidisciplinary perspectives of womanism to give me full life. So from ethics to Bible to the thick description and social scientist mastery and methodology of Cheryl Townsend Jones, who was able to do more and in greater depth than most sociologists of religion who, at that point, in my mind, in a very large lead sort of way, and I know why I posted that song, did little more than just repeat the painfully obvious. She was able to delve deeper and render up a thoroughgoing uh, sociology of religion that became a method for womanists outside of that who felt that we had that methodology. And just as soon as those pioneers and first generation scholars were saying, oh yes, not only is this not a fact, but this is a tool that is not necessarily trying to even interested in dismantling an exercise, but building new homes on our own foundations. And just as sure. We have to remember what Clay says. Everybody gets to talk to them. And then all of a sudden, people are asking questions. Right? Must I be a feminist? Mm. One of them is it's not about term. And that has been something that has been consistent. Things that are not projected onto people, but things that people have liked. And as black women were trying to make ways for themselves in the same way I was walking just trying to find a term to name herself. House Walker never tried to start the movement. We took that word. We, that, she gave her own statement. We saw it as a call. We responded with movement. And as soon as we joined in the mighty chorus, here comes right, different people on the course because of institutions. In the same way that Medicare or other homes is appropriate, or Martha Stewart appropriates a good black thing. Right. To institutionalize it in the same way. In order for people to get jobs, you mark the black women's bodies by what called them ones. Mm -hmm. And so you have black women being resentful or clapping back in different ways now, not at more than a but at the women who look like them that are still few in number saying, because you exist, you are making me diminish. Right. You were killing me off. And so womanism then started in many ways patterning white feminism. Where within one, one group, <laughs> one institution, people are fragmenting off into either waves or generations. Right? It's like all of a sudden, we need more womanist historians. So then it comes to a real generation of like with regards to time. But, and that's because something that was a spirit, something that had witnessed, had become institutionalized. And then we went on from there to now the, the iterations of womanism where it has sparked movements within churches, movements within social media, movements where there are now men saying uh, that they are womanists, men actually having positions uh, teaching womanism. And I had the wonderful opportunity when I was at Friendship West just last week where they actually had a womanist month. And I was talking to some woman in the hall, and some young girls were coming out there, and they said, you must be a womanist. So when they, there can be an obstacle of something that is just a word that takes on form and the witness of other women that becomes problematized even by women who look like them, but other people outside of the field realizing upon seeing that spirit, seeing that work, that that is what womanism is and that is what womanism looks like, lets us know that womanism is something that was wed, that was started by way, something that was forced within institutions, within our own fields, but something that now needs to attend to the formation of, and I think, as Judy said, the, how can we, as a community of scholars, do the work our souls must have while we are tending to prevent inventing ourselves 
not to the demise of others, not just for the survival of our people, but for our flourishing as well. Um, who has identified 
post baby boomers that millennials have emerged as the largest living generation. Um, but that reality of being the largest living generation and also being the most racially diverse generation has increased the number of folks who are going into advanced degrees and into programs. So we also own the status as the most educated. Um, but as an economist, um, I'm concerned about how, in many ways, that innovation and that education does not translate because we are often always the least compensated. You know? yeah. In the context of the church, particularly, um, when that new research agenda first was uh, uh, report first emerged, folks often talk about how millennials represented the group as the nuns or the folks who were categorized as atheists or agnostics were having little emphasis on religious identity. It is the millennial generation that we can no longer say, you were raised in the church. Mm -hmm. um, but those who are affiliated or unaffiliated in faith traditions have likely found that their reason to not again, affiliate with these faith traditions are often because when you say you're doing the work of justice or a part of the Jesus movement, um, and your praxis doesn't line up with your theory, right? Millennials are the first to question that. So the question really is not why are millennials leaving the church, but rather why are our churches or institutions failing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
21st century, black millennial women have stood up to answer the call to dispel every threat that seeks to impede our wholeness. Yeah. For many of us, and many millennial women, womanism is still our birthing ground toward truth-telling and justice-seeking and wisdom-bearing witness that centers ourselves and our communities. So yes, black millennial women have come to till the soil, to pluck up, but also to bear new seeds. Thus, the future of womanism is alive, and it's not only on the line, but it's also on the line. Yeah. Millennial womanism, thinking about millennials as digital natives, if we think about those who are as a generational cohort, folks who have been born from 1980 to 2000, their first entry into anything educational has been through technology, through the uh, assistance of not only laptops, but TV, but also their iPhones and other things, right? And in this way, how do we uh, continue to not only spread the word of womanism as a prophetic endeavor to our churches, but how do we spread this word in relation to a global atmosphere? Here, what connects us oftentimes is our technology. I'm reminded of when in Ferguson, when use the hashtag Black Lives Matter, how they not only became, help us to give reports about what was really going on, despite the lies that were being surfaced on Fox News and others, but they were also able to use that very hashtag in order to uh, have dialogue with the Palestinian context and other contexts who could give some global perspective to being teared up by gas masks and being beaten uh, by flaws and other so in this way, a millennial womanism is that interest of how can we continue to further these conversations in ways that are technically excellent but also efficient, that they become easy access, that this word then becomes something that can be literally spread among us. We seek then to draw on a unique womanist epistemological and 